All right. So um, thanks, David, for your wonderful talk. Um, it was very interesting. Um, our next speaker and also the last speaker of today is Dr. Jenny Grork. Um, she holds a Bachelor of Art, um, higher diploma and PhD in psychology from the National University of Ireland, Galloway. She is a lecturer in health psychology at Queen's University, Belfast. Before moving to Belfast, Jenny was a pro professional singer and community music facilitator, facilitator for many years. Her research examines emotional experiences such as loneliness, stress and anxiety, as well as designing and evaluating interventions to reduce negative emotions and improve quality of life. Music is an important focus of her work and its role in stress and anxiety reduction across the lifespan. Thanks a lot, Jenny. Thank you, Amir, and thanks everybody for um, tuning in. I'm not gonna look at how many people are tuning in. Um, that'll only make me nervous, but it's nice to know that some of my colleagues from all over the world were able to join in today. Um, and difficult act to follow, David Huron's amazing um, lecture, real big picture stuff and uh, very thought provoking. Um, my presentation is focusing on two experimental studies that are more basic science um, questions and focused on anxiety reduction as an important outcome. So, oh, I can't move forward. Oh, here we go, <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, so I know a lot of us do most of our research with university students, often out of convenience, but we're also really aware that there is a real problem with mental health in this community. Um, up to a third of students have psychological difficulties with a quarter dropping out due to stress and up to half of students experience frequent anxiety throughout their college years. We also know that chronic exposure to stress, stress and anxiety can cause a number of psychological and physical health problems like depression, high blood pressure, increased vulnerability to illness. And so finding interventions to ameliorate those negative emotional experiences and the impact of those on our health is really important. Um, some of my research has looked at different interventions in clinical health populations, um, but I'm very interested in low resource interventions and activities that are easily accessible to people and available in their everyday life. And so one of these activities I've focused most on is music listening. So we know it's a really frequent behavior in everyday life. More than three quarters of adults listen to music every day. University students listen up to four hours a day. And we also know that music is really pervasive in people's everyday lives. So studies, experience sampling studies, for example, would find that music is present in some way in up to a half of episodes sampled. Um, we also know from survey research and different music psychology approaches that affect regulation or listening to music in order to change or improve your emotions is the most common reason for listening to music. And some have gone as far as to say that affect regulation is therefore the most important function of music. And there's now a pretty extensive and impressive literature demonstrating that music listening has positive effects on stress and anxiety. And most recently in the last couple of years, there's been some convincing systematic reviews and meta-analyses showing positive effects of listening to music on stress-related outcomes. Um, so something I've become interested in more recently is trends in how people are consuming music in the digital era, let's say. So I've been checking in with these surveys that are produced annually by the International Federation of the Phonographic Industry. So they're basically consumer surveys about how people are listening to music and what they're using to do that. Um, they usually have a huge number of stud, um, respondents, like 35,000 respondents from um, countries all over the world. So a lot of their research will confirm what we have found using more rigorous um, methods that music listening is very frequent. People are listening up to 18 hours a week, corresponding to up to three hours a day. Um, but what I'm particularly interested in is um, how the devices that people are using and the formats that they're using to consume music. So 
um, while traditional methods like the radio and personal collections are still very common, um, audio streaming is becoming a lot more common and video streaming is becoming a lot more common as well. So about 20% of weekly music listening time is now taken up by on-demand video streaming and particularly through sites like YouTube. So taking all that together, um, we know that music listening is a very common and frequent behavior in everyday life and that people are often using it to regulate their emotions um, and that the experimental evidence is telling us that it works so that it has a benefit on people's stress and anxiety. Um, we're also aware that music consumption patterns are changing and in particular that video streaming is taking up a much larger share of music listening time. So there's somewhat of a gap in our knowledge about whether there is an impact of music video watching on affect regulation. So as our first question was, well, what is the effect of music video watching on regulation? And secondly, how does it compare in effectiveness to music listening? So we know that music listening is effective for affect regulation. So why would music videos also regulate affect? Well, like music, we know that visual art and pictures can also evoke emotional experiences. We often use film clips in the lab to induce emotions. Um, we know that watching television shows um, can also significantly reduce stress. And so we might wonder then if music alone regulates affect and, and video and art alone can regulate affect, is there a kind of additive effect of combining the two together? Um, perhaps um, we know that music enhances the emotional effect of, of film from research on music soundtracks. It enhances enjoyment of video gaming. Um, a recent-ish study um, had people self-select sad music by YouTube, but it induced the correct mood. So um, we might expect that both music and video regulate affect, but maybe music videos have a, some, some advantage over music listening alone. Um, so in terms of what we were gonna compare music videos and music listening to, there's some decisions to be made about how you choose control conditions in these experimental studies. So the vast majority of studies would use silence. Um, that's problematic for a number of reasons. One being that if you want to understand the effect of music in everyday life, silence is not a very suitable control condition because um, sitting completely unoccupied in silence for five minutes is um, you know, a really rare occurrence. Um, and in everyday life, people have a range of things and activities to choose from if they want to change their mood. So sitting in silence probably isn't what they do. Um, other activities people have used, like white noise and solving geometry tasks, um, they can also vary in terms of how relaxing, neutral or aversive they are. So if you're comparing them to music or music videos, um, they may be an unfair comparison. So we agree that active control conditions should be used that are similarly distracting and capture people's attention. And in this case, we wanted to use something auditory and visual. So we did two studies. One we did in the lab, um, the other was online. They both used the same conditions and participants were randomized into one of three possible conditions. So we compared music listening with music video watching and our active control condition was non-music video watching. So watching other videos than, than music videos. Because um, we were interested in whether music videos reduce negative affect, in this case anxiety, we wanted to induce negative affect. So we used a stressor, a really common um, stressor, uh, which is the threat of public speaking. So if you want to make somebody feel anxious, you tell them they have to give a, a speech that's, well, in this case, potentially being watched by 300 people. Um, it makes everybody feel nervous. Um, and we also combined that with a um, challenging arithmetic task. We had to adapt this a little bit to the online um, study. So we told people at the end of the experiment procedure, um, we'll ask you to record a video of a speech using your webcam. Um, okay, so the outcomes we measured were state anxiety in both studies, so um, self-reported anxiety. And in the lab study, we also took physiological measures of arousal, so heart rate and blood pressure. 
We measured our outcomes at three time points at baseline after a brief habituation period. Um, then we introduced the stressor where we told people they would be making a speech later with the arithmetic task. Then we measured our outcomes again to see um, if the stressor was effective. And then we measured our outcomes again following either music listening, music video watching, or our active control condition, which was non-music video watching. So it's important to note that at this final time point, people still think they're going to have to give a speech. So they're still in the stressful scenario. So we're really looking at how music listening or video watching prepares people in it for a stressor. The stressor. Um, so we used a range of experimental stimuli. So the stimuli were the same for the music listening or the music video condition. Um, in that if you were in the music video condition, you got music plus video. If you were assigned to the music listening condition, you heard only the music. Um, they were different um, music selections in both studies, but relatively the same kind of pop, indie, rock, rap, country, and dance music. We also used a variety of um, non-music videos, so uh, kind of popular ones that I like, which are funny fail videos where you watch people falling over <laughs> for three minutes, uh, travel vlogs, and how-to videos. So importantly, um, participants were assigned to one of three conditions and they could choose from a list of five which experimental stimuli they wanted to watch. Just one. Okay, so... Um, the number of participants was um, 62 in study one and 71 in study two. And they were fairly evenly matched in terms of age. And as in all of my studies, anyway, I don't know about everybody else's, there was twice as many females to males. Um, so just going straight into the results then. Um, in study one, we found no significant effects on physiological measures. Um, wasn't completely surprised by that. Um, our recent paper, we compared self-selected and researcher-selected music, and while we found self-report uh, measures, uh, significant effects on self-report, we didn't find any on physiological measures. Um, one of the meta-analyses I talked about earlier found music didn't have any effect on psychophysiological reactivity, um, and another recent meta-analysis said Music does have an effect on physiology, but the effect is weaker than on self-report measures. So something to consider um, going forward. Then in terms of our uh, state anxiety, in study one, we found that there was a significant increase in anxiety after the stressor, uh, which we would predict, uh, which was a relief to see. Um, we also saw that there was a significant reduction in anxiety after the intervention. Um, but we didn't find a significant effect of condition or an interaction effect. So there was no difference in um, anxiety reduction across these three different conditions. Uh, we found the exact same pattern of findings in study two in our online replication study. So um, we replicated that effect um, that anxiety significantly increased after the stressor and decreased after music listening, music video watching, or non-music video watching. Um, so one positive take home here at least is that our online um, modification of the stressor was effective. Um, we can also conclude that music video watching did have a positive impact on affect regulation across both our studies, and that it was similar in effectiveness as music listening. Um, but we have to exercise some caution because um, our active control condition of non-music video watching also had the same benefits on regulation. So um, often with these kind of simple designs and, and small studies moving in a, a small incremental advance, you're left with a lot of questions. Um, so some of these I've been kind of pondering and toying around with is the idea that maybe the lack of group differences is a result of choice and control. So participants in each of the three conditions had the same amount of choice and control over the music they heard or the videos they watched. Um, so maybe it's choice and control that is the mechanism of action rather than anything specific about the music or the video. And general theories of stress and coping would say that actually agency 
and feeling a sense of control over a stressful situation is actually um, really central to stress reduction. So that's something um, I need to consider in light of other studies where I found um, when I introduced active control conditions, there was uh, less significant effect of music. Um, another thing, well, we didn't, there was a lot of things we didn't measure in the study, and I'm sure those will come up in our Q&A, and I'm happy to talk about them further. But we didn't really measure any qualities of the music video or the music listening. So we didn't look for any particular features like tempo or um, style. And obviously, um, music videos come in lots of different styles as well. So there's some music videos that are performance based. There's others that have you know, a strong plot or storyline. And there are some others that um, you know, maybe have a, a very strong political or social message. And so they're not all created equal, obviously. And there may be some aspects of music videos that helped reduce anxiety or indeed the non-music videos as well. Um, and we didn't explore any of those. Um, we also know quite a bit about regulation strategies and music listening. So we know um, about things like distraction, uh, reappraisal, um, all of these different strategies and mechanisms through which music reduces anxiety. Um, and, you know, we may question or wonder whether they're exactly the same for music video watching. Are they the same regulation strategies or are there video specific regulation strategies? There may be other models um, that are more suitable in this medium. And then finally, um, you know, maybe worth thinking more about maybe people use different formats or different devices for different functions of music listening. So maybe people don't watch music videos for affect regulation to the same extent that maybe they listen to music for affect regulation. Um, and that's something obviously we didn't address in the study either. Um, there's also some, um, another study I'm working on at the moment um, is suggesting that maybe emotional reasons are actually less common than we previously thought. And I know there's another group in, um, of my colleagues in Uvascula that are working on something similar where perhaps emotion, emotional reasons are less, um, less frequent than we thought they were um, using survey-based research. Um, we also know from some of these uh, music consumer reports that um, younger people listen to music in different ways and they tend to have more functions of music listening where music is often accompanying other activities. So they listen to music when they're commuting or um, doing other uh, exercising or going to sleep. And so maybe these, th this change in patterns of music listening functions is also related to changing consumption patterns. So perhaps the increase in video streaming is um, taking over a greater share of certain functions of music listening. So again, um, many questions I have <laughs> to continue um, researching in this, in this vein. So I think, um, you know, there's very little research on music video watching. Um, I think this is the first study I've come across, at least to look at the impact of music video watching on affect regulation. Um, it suggests that it's beneficial um, and to a similar extent as music listening, um, but obviously quite a lot of um, questions remaining. And, you know, variables we just didn't measure as part of this design, um, and that can be adapted in future research going forward. So um, I am going to finish up there. I see Amelia is just popping, <laughs> popping up to tell me to stop. Um, so thank you everyone for listening and uh, keep your questions coming. Great, thank you very much, Jenny. <laughs> um, and mild. <laughs> <laughs> we have um, roughly about eight minutes for questions. So a um, first one is I had a couple of questions about how you think music can then be implemented for therapy and therapeutic use and how helpful you think it will be in reducing stress and anxiety? Um, well, again, I mean, I don't want to step out of my lane because music therapy is not my field at all. Um, I, I'm just, uh, just a, a, a psychologist. Um, so I don't know much about the music therapy approaches, but my feeling is that um, 
even if the effect sizes of listening to music in everyday life are, are very small, um, music be listening behavior is so pervasive and so common that actually um, it as a public health um, intervention, it may be quite significant actually. And that um, while I don't know, I can't comment really on one-to-one on -one, um, therapeutic relationships, my sense is that actually on a population level, um, music listening has quite a therapeutic effect or a public health impact. Great. Um, and kind of akin to that, we've had a couple of questions about whether you think um, a particular type of music is particularly helpful or whether all music can be helpful at all. Because, of course, if we're listening to scary music, like in a horror film, that's going to be anxiety inducing rather than reducing it. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important question, but get, it, it's really tricky again. Um, I've usually in experimental research kind of operationalized music listening as kind of binary, either did or not listen, rather than looking at more complex, um, you know, um, features of the music even. Um, I did do a recent study where I compared self-selected music, which again, was just really random, you know, a lot of Taylor Swift, a lot of Ed Sheeran, um, a little bit of heavy metal, um, but really variable. And compared that with a relaxing piece of music and using the same design and found there was no difference um, in anxiety reduction between um, whether people listen to their own music or whether people listened to, uh, you know, relaxing, slow tempo music. So um, I think, yeah, probably, well, my gut feeling is that actually just listening to music is most important and that the, probably the act of choosing your preferred music may be the actual mechanism or, or, or a significant part of why it's relaxing or why it's anxiety reducing. Um, so yeah, uh, somebody could convince me otherwise and reviewers do often ask me, you know, but you didn't control for the music. Um, or differences in the music, and they may very well be part of the effect, but um, I think preference and control are, are really key in anxiety reduction. Great. Um, and kind of similar to that as well, we've had a couple of questions whether you think it has to be music at all, or whether other kind of calming sounds like birdsong, whale music could also help reduce stress, or again, maybe that is just down to preferences. Yeah, I think. Um, like I said, something I'm kind of maybe trying to come to terms with about um, some of the experimental research is that, yeah, it may not actually be music at all. It may be, um, it, it may be selection of, of an appropriate activity. So actually anything, it, it could just be more general processes like something distracting or something engaging or something you like, that, that it may be just all those things together that, that give music this positive effect rather than specifically music so yeah that would open up the possibility that if you if you like nature sounds and, and you find them distracting then those those probably would have benefits as well mm -hmm. and we have a couple of questions on kind of the immersiveness of it so do you think using headphones or earphones or how you listen to music and creating that kind of more sense of immersiveness or not and whether actually having a music video makes it more immersive rather than just the song itself. Yeah, I think that's um, probably very key as well. Um, some of my research before looked at different, um, different functions of music and this idea of creating a personal space came out as being really significant, especially for younger people. And that this was, um, you know, a space in which they they used for many different other effects. So just trying to block out distractions to produce work, but also to create a kind of mental space to do um, emotional work. And so, yes, I think it was, um, you know, something kind of engaging about that. And uh, in my experimental research, people are always listening on headphones, but yeah, I haven't looked at that question particularly, but I do, I know that there's um, well, there's some great research happening again in Uvascula. Um, Joanna Wilson is looking at music videos in particular, and um, I suppose looking at different types of music videos and how some may be more immersive, and that that might be. Um, I would say maybe that is a key feature of the affect regulation, though she's looking at different outcomes. 
Um, I think that that's probably a, a good possibility. Um, and we probably have time for one more question. Um, so we've had a couple kind of uh, alluding to whether you think, why you think music is used so frequently, especially like in the younger adults, and um, whether you think there's any cultural differences and how that might impact the, ther the therapeutic benefits of the music. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm not sure what I think about um, age differences. I think music listening is de like, it's definitely more common um, in very young, ad very young adults and, and much older adults. And I would say that both those age groups probably need intervention um, quite a bit in terms of um, providing emotional support in young adults or social support in older adults. Um, and yet there's some research coming out that makes me think maybe young people are using music for this reason less. And actually it's more just um, background to other tasks. And something that did kind of um, did come out in some of my earlier research was how young people particularly use music to block out other people. So to prevent social interaction and to prevent having to have awkward conversations. And so maybe they're, they're just using music in different ways, though um, I wouldn't say it's any less effective for them for anxiety reduction, but maybe they need it more, but use it less for that reason. Um, in terms of cultural differences, it's hard again for me to comment on that because um, unfortunately all of my research has been done in Ireland with mostly really ethnically um, homogenous groups. Um, and so I don't really know, um, and Ireland is an extremely musical culture, so um, maybe we're an anomaly compared to other people, but um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think just in terms of um, how cultures decide what music is relaxing and not is quite different. Uh, if you've ever heard Irish traditional music, it's certainly not relaxing, but <laughs> people tend to listen to it um, in all functions and all gatherings. So. Um, maybe that says something about our musical culture. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I don't have any time for more questions, but they will be saved and sent to you anyway. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Jenny. Bye.